On the altar of the stave church at Urnas, there stands a candle holder in the form of a Viking ship. An example of medieval ironwork, it is not much younger than the church itself. It has been here for a good 800 years and could have been stolen at any time. The fact that it never has been stolen is one of the finest testimonies to this land of fields, where up until a few years ago, theft was unknown. Studying this simple work of art for a while, it becomes easy to understand the original significance of the candle holder. Lingering in quiet contemplation, that is how the visitor gradually wins the heart of a stave church and loses his own to it. The nine candles on the ship tell us that the light of Christianity came to Norway by boat by boat, not exactly a surprise. In Norway, everything has always come by boat. Goods, people, wars. Even the thief who will one day steal the candle holder after all will arrive by boat. The little ferry sails to and fro like a busy bee. In autumn, winter and spring, it takes schoolchildren home. But in summer, it is full of tourists who want to visit Norway's oldest stave church. But there was something special about the ship that brought the message of Christ to Norway. It wasn't missionaries who were on board, but brutal plunderers. The boat is a Viking ship. The Vikings first made their impact on history in AD 793 when they attacked the holy Isle of Lindisfarne just off the English coast, destroying the monastery and murdering its monks. Laden with booty, they returned home to their fields, with blood on their hands and burdened by the first doubts as to whether their actions were justified. They saw the light. And this is what the candle hold in Ornus symbolizes. No army of crusaders, no knightly order, no armed missionaries brought Christianity to Norway. Nevertheless, it was Christianized with the sword. Because here, as in other places, the Christian faith was an ideology that was useful for the formation of a state. One God, one King, one Empire. And an Empire that was hard to defeat. Ornus lies on one of the many arms of the Sonja Fjord. More than 200 kilometers long, it cuts deep into Norway's inland. So those who wanted to maintain their veneration of the Germanic gods found many a remote bay. Villages and tribes had to be converted by force and compelled to build churches. Refusal to do so meant war. That is probably how the little church in Ornus came into being, or rather its predecessor. Hundreds of churches were built and hundreds of them survived the Middle Ages. There was one church for every 500 inhabitants of this sparsely populated country. It was only in more modern times that they began to disappear. Today, no more than 30 exist. But what is a stave church? In contrast to blockhouse construction, which didn't appear until later, with stave construction, the planks for the walls are installed vertically, 
and the roof is supported by pillars or posts. At first, the planks and posts were sunk in the earth. This made the building stable, but it exposed the timber to rot. Such churches survived for two to three hundred years, but not for an entire millennium. The post holes from at least one predecessor church have been found under the stave church at Ornus. The present building dates back to around 1130. It's the oldest wooden church in the world. However, it doesn't actually correspond to our view of a stave church since there are no dragon's heads on the roof. From a technical point of view, the church is a perfect stave building, a frame structure insulated from the damp earth by stone foundations. The ground sills on which the entire church rests protrude on all sides beneath the large wall sills. At the corners, the wall sills are enclosed and held firmly together by pillar bases. Everything intermeshes. Like a ship, the church is inherently stable. The stave churches are coated again and again with birch tar to make the wood waterproof. That's why they are often black and scaly, especially on the north side, which receives little sunshine. Stave churches smell not of incense, but of wood and birch tar. People who live near a stave church have known the smell ever since their baptism. Here we see how the pillars that support the nave rest on the ground sills and have done so for nearly 900 years. How many generations have walked over these sills and touched the wood of these pillars with their hands? The pillar capitals in Ornus were based on those found in Romanesque stone churches. That's a special feature of this church in Urnus, the models for which stand in Rome and Ravenna, Avignon and Aachen. Cubic capitals like these don't actually belong on wooden pillars. Since they are bigger than the timber that was available, we know that the corners were attached with wooden pins. The wood carvings are perhaps based on the book art of early Irish and Scottish monks, who were so often the victims of Viking raids. Conspicuous amongst the puzzling symbols is the statue of a bishop. Irrespective of who he was, as a bishop, he was a man of Rome, called by the Pope. It's as if the builders of the church wanted to make a mark for Rome in their still semi-pagan world. But where it was dark, the old beliefs came through time and again. Medieval graffiti on the interior walls show how the faithful was still attached to the world of pagan symbols. Many believe that the Norwegians only emerged from their pre-Christian darkness with the Reformation, in other words, after 1537. Let there be light Enlightened priests exclaimed, and had windows sawn out of the walls of their churches, as large as possible. Urnus experienced more changes than most of the other churches. Pews were installed, along with a pulpit from which admonishing and uplifting words were spoken. In the past, people followed the service standing up, in semi-darkness or by candlelight a ritual whose significance is not completely understood. But modern man, who had by now made his entrance, approached things with his intellect. When the altar of Our Lady on the left-hand side of the nave was demolished by the reformers, who regarded it as a relic of the Dark Ages, some superstitious virginity cult, they overlooked its supporting function. As a result, the entire church listed to one side. Struts were quickly installed right through the nave, and in doing so, the reformers even caused damage.
What makes the little church at Urnus stand out in particular are a portal and some of the wall planks of the predecessor church. It was only a hundred years older, and we have no idea just why it was demolished. Parts of the old church were used in the construction of the new one. This carving work is unique, and today the term Urnus style refers to all works of the Middle Ages in which creatures and plants are interwoven in this way. Portrayed on the left-hand side of the portal is a fabulous creature, perhaps one of the mythical stags, which, according to Germanic legend, graze in the crown of the Egdrasil, the world ash tree. It has sunk its teeth in the neck of a dragon or a winged snake, which has also managed to bite the stag's neck. A serpent constantly ate away at the roots of the Egdrasil. Try to follow the figure of the snake, which seems to lose itself in tendrils and in other creatures. Here, a wing spreads out, while the body twists about itself. The tail lies over the neck of another snake, which has sunk its fangs into the tail of a third snake. This, in turn, has bitten into one of those tendrils, which, on closer inspection, also prove to be savage. The serpents of the Ögdra seal not only feed off it, they are also part of the tree, half snake, half tendril. Portrayed here is the battle of a highly elegant, fabulous creature, seemingly half animal, half plant, against a world of serpents, which are all inextricably intertwined as they grapple with one another. The west gable reveals the same scene. Damaged by centuries of weathering so as to be almost unrecognizable, the figures are hidden behind panelling. What is the significance of this carving, especially in a church? It is probably a portrayal of Ragnarok, the apocalypse of Germanic mythology. When the stags and serpents of the Yggdrasil begin to fight one another, the tree will die and the world will be doomed. But why was the old, so richly decorated church at Urnus torn down? It is highly unlikely that it was dilapidated, nor was it too small. Perhaps because it was full of pagan symbols? A wooden basilica was erected on the same site, the most Roman of all stave churches. But if the aim was to break free from the pagan past, why were parts of the old church used in its construction? The Vikings had still not been fully converted to Christianity. So was the aim to give them a sign that the prophecy contained in ancient legend had already come to pass, that the old order would be destroyed and replaced by a renewed world. The legend had no idea what this new world would look like, but the builders of the church at Ornus believed that they knew it was the world of the Redeemer. <laughs>